tonight on the Black Channel. The full court press is on to erase the presence of black people and the media is leading the charge. Tonight's program here, I've been lining a few of these things up here, so I wanted to go ahead and talk about this tonight. So you're being forewarned in advance that this is gonna be a bit of a deep dive and I wanted to deal with these things because it's important for us to do so. Watch the language that is thrown at us. Watch the language that is thrown at us. Watch the subtle maneuvering that's thrown at us. Watch as these things go on and on. Watch as it happens. Because I want you to be aware of that. I want you to be aware of the tactics that they will use for that. I want you to be aware of the tactics they'll use. There was a news piece that was put up here by PBS. Just so you see there, it says Tulsa faces reckoning over historical racism as state law restricts how history is taught. Folks, you got to understand something. Understand that these folks know what they're doing and that we have won. You got to understand that they recognize that they have lost over the last 20 years. They have lost. And they're letting you know that they know they've lost. They have lost because we didn't stop doing what we do. We didn't stop spreading the word. We didn't stop talking to each other. We didn't stop popularizing it. Some of the folks that you might laugh at otherwise. And those people, even some of them, the, the Hotep community and everything else, the word has gotten around. We have been stalwart about our history. We have been stalwart about it. So now in state to state, legislature to legislature, they are attempting to weaponize their legislatures to erase our history which means that they are relying on complacency. They're letting you know the word has gotten too damn far around. You see, the schools didn't teach reparations. The schools did not teach reparations. There was no classroom you've ever been in where the teachers gave you a lesson on the need for reparations. There's no classroom you've been in that the teachers gave you a lesson on the need for restorative justice. And yet it is front and center. This is the culmination of decades of work. And one of the key ones has been the Black Wall Street. Back in the 90s, there was a resurgence of blackness as rap music coming out of the 80s was serving the needs of black people. It was the music of resistance. It was the music of revolutionaries. And everywhere you turned, it was the music of the revolution. And that wasn't just a one day, one month, one year thing. This was a campaign. And it swept the nation, swept the world and took over everything. That's why the corporations had to come in and dumb it down or at least attempt to. But in the internet age, even that is no longer working. It was already out of the gate. It was already out of the gate. It's too late to put it back in the barn now. It's already streaming down the track. So you got to deal with this out here now. You can't put the genie back in the bottle. So they're saying, okay, if we can't put the genie back in the bottle, let's see if we can kill him. Let's see if we can at least slow him down. So when you talk about the Black Wall Street, particularly the one in Tulsa, Oklahoma, as you all know here, we expanded people's knowledge to let them know there were many around the country. But when you talk about particularly Tulsa, Oklahoma, then you have to get into what happened to it. The first bombing of an American city by American government. That was the first one. The second one was against black folk in Philadelphia. Move. So every time America takes revolutionary radical action, it's always against black people. Every time that posse comitatus is violated, Every time that they take some criminal action that clearly violates the Constitution, it's always against black folk. Always. 
So what I want to do here is I want to play this piece for you now. Granted, it's 14 minutes long, but there's a lot to learn here. There's a lot to unpack. I want you to pay attention to this. We're going to do some stops in here, but there's something I want you to learn from this. There's a lot to learn. For the past few years, as the country's been reckoning with questions of race, justice, and equality. Race, justice, and equality. Ma'am, I think you mean reparations. I think the word you're looking for and just waltzed right over was reparations. She said every word except reparations. Don't worry, it's coming. Over the past few years, as the country's been reckoning with questions of race, justice, and equality, many state legislatures have passed laws restricting how American history, particularly institutional racism and its legacy today, can be taught in public schools. Tonight, Judy Woodruff visits her native Tulsa, Oklahoma, to try to understand how that city, amid its own reckoning, is navigating this moment. It's her latest installment of America at a Crossroads. This is where the Dreamland Theater uh, was located. And my great aunt Jamie, when she was 17 years old, she went on a date. Who would have known that during this date, the massacre happened? This is the reason they got to try to make laws against us now. Because folks have been passing the stories down and telling the stories. Everybody ain't been just sitting around watching world star hip hop. This is why you got to start passing laws. It's like, okay, we got to start passing laws now because y'all are getting too serious and you're doing too damn much. We got to start passing laws. They're letting you know how serious black folk talking to each other. They made it illegal when we were slaves. Don't get together talking to each other by yourselves. Now we're able to talk to each other by ourselves in groups of thousands and tens of thousands. They're like, hey, we got to make some laws now. Because you're talking too much to each other. Community activist Christy Williams is a descendant of Janie Edwards, who was just a teenager in Tulsa more than 100 years ago when she snuck out one Saturday night for a date and found herself fleeing for her life. She remembered that there were gunshots flying everywhere, uh, there was fire everywhere, and she said they dropped bombs. Um, and you could smell the fire and the smoke from miles and miles away. The day before, a young black man working as a shoe shiner was arrested for allegedly assaulting a white woman on an elevator. A confrontation at the courthouse followed, and on the morning of June 1st, 1921, a mob of white men chased a group of black men into Greenwood, a 35-block district of black-owned businesses and homes known as Black Wall Street, killing an untold number of residents and burning their community to the ground. Yet the stories of what happened in Tulsa that weekend were for a long time buried in fear, intimidation, and shame. They didn't want to repeat it because they always feared that if they talked about it around the people who did it, who were, who were looting the homes and burning the homes and killing people, so you didn't want that to happen again. So you kept quiet about it. And this reminds you of so much of what you hear in South Africa today. In South Africa today, you are encouraged to have truth and reconciliation allegedly, but not restorative justice. So they're telling you, you need to live next door to the white supremacists who executed these war crimes but that you're to be quiet about it. So you're sitting there in plain sight. So what they've done is created a white supremacist police state where you are telling your children a code of omerta. Don't speak about what these folks have done. Recognize this is a pattern of behavior. And oh yes, once again, they claim that the cause of it was somebody has violated one of our nasty ass raggedy white women. For decades, other stories about Tulsa have been told, a place once known as the oil capital of the world. But more recently, home to new residents, drawn by an affordable cost of living and a transforming downtown, rich in music, history, and culture. This, 
This land is your land. Black folk built the music of this land. Black folk did that. This is our accomplishment. The descendants of the slaves did this. This is what we built. This is what we built. This is what we did. So when I tell you about erasing our presence, I want you to just understand that anytime that you see American historical music with somebody holding a guitar in their hands, it is a black person who built that and did this. But if you let them tell the tale, they're going to remove you, replace it with a white face and tell you that's who did it. That's why it's important for us to speak to each other because understand white folk ain't saying that black folk created rock and roll anymore. Do y'all realize that? White folk are not telling you that black people created rock and roll anymore. They're not saying that anymore. They don't tell you that black folk created the blues. Black folk created jazz. 25 years ago, they didn't have such of a problem saying that. Now they do. Now, everywhere you go, they talk about American music, but they no longer wish to mention the people who created it. Because then you start saying, well, hell, how is it black folk made it and now they've been divorced from it? How the hell can that be? So just understand, this is a conscious effort that as they lose ground and lose control, then they start rewriting the history. Now they're erasing it in real time. Including Greenwood. In fact, my own story began here. I was born and spent the early years of my life in this, the second largest city in Oklahoma. I only lived in Tulsa for five years, but I came back often to visit family, especially my grandmother, who lived in this house in North Tulsa. I never remember hearing anything about Greenwood until news reports began to circulate a few years ago. Now she talking about a few years ago, it's 2023. We've been talking about Greenwood, Archer, and Pine for decades. So that lets you know how deeply ingrained the code of Emer Omerita is. Just like with Skip Gates, who talked to the white man whose family owned the plantation, and his father told him, we don't talk about the slaves. He asked his dad, what about the slaves? And his dad told him, we don't talk about the slaves. So just recognize that their thing is, it's okay to erase history now. Usually if they tell you we need to remember history, now they're saying it's okay to erase it. Now it's all right to erase it. They don't even want their own children to know what happened. It's all right to completely erase history now. We're sitting right sort of at the epicenter of the 1921 Tulsa race massacre, arguably the worst incident of urban racial violence in American history. And it was not discussed openly um, for nearly 75, 80 years. So this. Now, let me explain to you. Let me put that in its proper context for all of you. Jewish people didn't have to wait 75 years before the atrocities of the Jewish Holocaust in Europe were mentioned, discussed, and addressed. They got taken care of in real time as they went. They were immediately seen to. Japanese people didn't have to wait 75 years before what happened to them in the internment camps in America was addressed, was mentioned, was discussed, was talked about. They didn't have to wait damn near 100 years. It was mentioned, talked about, and addressed at that time as they went. The other thing here is when you say it was an act of racial violence, well, you're absolutely correct about that. It was also an act of socioeconomic violence as well. So you haven't addressed any of these things, but that is deliberately so. Don't worry. We're going to get to reparations. Hats off here to PBS news hour about this, but they're going to get to reparations here too. And Mayor Bynum, just remember him. Of urban racial violence in American history. And it was not discussed openly um, for nearly 75, 80 years. 
So this represents the, the evolution of Tulsa's really racial history. Tulsa's mayor, G.T. Bynum, comes from a long line of Tulsans, as well as former city mayors on both sides of his family. And the goal, of course, at the very top is uh, reconciliation. Let me tell you all, this is offensive. I'm going to try to keep my blood pressure down. This is offensive. This is brainwashing. Do not let yourselves or your children fall for this propagandistic garbage they're doing right here. You see as they keep easing this in, let me show you, this is anathema to itself. First you say murder, arson, looting, green wood, but then you say, and at the very top, the goal is supposed to be. The goal, of course, at the very top is, and the goal, of course, at the very top is, uh, reckon everybody keeps talking about that here's the issue drill this through your cinder block oakwood thick head when they talk about jewish people did you notice that jewish people were never told that their goal the goal should be reconciliation with the germans that the goal should be reconciliation with italy that the goal should be reconciliation with Russia. You notice they're never told that. No one ever tells these other groups. The Japanese were not told that their goal needs to be reconciliation with the white government. They were never told that. Native Americans, the red ones, were never told, so-called red ones, were never told that their goal is supposed to be reconciliation. The only place that you see this word invoked, the only place you see this word brought up is black people, particularly foundationals. We're the only ones that this word comes up with. The only ones. Then you go over to Africa. Once again, the only place you see this word brought up is when white folk owe black people something. Then all of a sudden, it's about integration and reconciliation that we need to come to. Well, you need, we need to get to a point where we're friendly with y'all. You know, Jewish people have never been told they need to be friendly with anybody. Jewish people have never been told that their goal is to be friends, buddies, lifelong pals, or to get along with anybody. That's why they focus on their economics so hard because they know they can't depend on these Anglos. So their goal isn't reconciliation. It's empowerment, not reconciliation. We're told that our goal is to figure out how to shake hands with everybody. And this microphone told you over a decade ago, damn that. We don't need to be friends with anyone. Well, our goal shouldn't be to be friends with people. Certainly not with people who have brutalized us, murdered us, killed us with impunity. Our goal isn't to be, quote, friends with them. We don't need to be friends with you. I'm sounding like Dr. Khalid Muhammad now. We don't need to be friends with you. There's nothing there to be friends with. And being friends with you is not compensation for what you did. We need to reconcile. We can't reconcile a damn thing until you have served reparations. We can't reconcile a damn thing. They're telling you that we need to figure out how to reconcile without it costing them anything. That's what they mean by reconciliation. You all need to figure out how to let this go and get right with what happened without it costing us, the perpetrators, anything. So we need to reconcile. When you let them know, I didn't come here to shake your damn hand and be your buddy. I didn't come to go on a date with your daughter. I came here to get what you owe, every penny of it. When you say that, you can take the damn reconciliation sign down. I ain't for it. I didn't come for that. People, we understand something. I said this before about black folk. Let me say this about the greater dominant society here. When folks tell you we need to have unity to hell with unity. 
if unity means you get let off scot-free for what you did, to hell with unity. You can go to hell with reconciliation if that means letting you off the hook for what you did. I don't give a damn if it takes seven years, seven decades, seven lifetimes. You owe, and we gonna stay on your back until it's paid, and the longer you drag this out, the more interest will be on top of it. But as far as being your buddy, your pal, any of that garbage, hell no, it can jump off at any second. On account of the fact you owe, it can jump off at any moment. It really can. Damn reconciliation. Reconciliation is not a goal. Don't let some damn screw job ass Poindexter mayor sit up here and tell you that our goal should be rep should be reconciliation. Our goal is reparations, not reconciliation. We don't give a damn about reconciling with you. We are perfectly cool if you giving us the evil eye every damn day. You doing it now. Our goal isn't to be good with you or friendly with you. Our goal isn't reconciliation. Our goal is empowerment because you could be reconciled with us one day and then you go back to having animosity the next but if we are empowered, it doesn't matter whether you feel conciliatory one day or whether you feel hostile the next, you won't be able to harm us on any day. When we're empowered, it doesn't matter if you feel conciliatory towards us or whether you feel friendly towards us or not. When we're empowered, that becomes irrelevant. Here's the problem. We can reconcile with you with our condition never having been changed. You sat up here and knocked us on the bottom. You've got us oppressed. We can reconcile with you and still remain oppressed. What we cannot do is become empowered and still remain oppressed. So which is more important to you all? Being reconciled to them or being empowered? If you say it's more important to be empowered, give me the black fist in the chat room and hit the likes button. There's over 3,000 people in here watching live. If you think it's more important to have empowerment than reconciliation, give me the black fist in the chat room and hit the likes button. Unless I got a bunch of folks in here, Jason, you wrong. You know, we really need to reconcile over here. You got to soften them up, Jason. You can't just give them a the front door. You got to soften them up. Can't do too much too soon. Uh, reconciliation for us as a community. In 2021, he apologized for the city's failure to protect black Tulsans 100 years earlier and from decades of discrimination after. So for all the folks out there who say, we need to get an apology. Okay, well, he's given an apology here, but okay, what you gonna do about it? You have acknowledged that there's been a wrong that's been done to black folk that has plagued them ever since. What are you gonna do? Well, uh, you know, we can have reconciliation. Damn your reconciliation. I'm trying to warn y'all. Don't let these folks sit up here and fool you with that. Don't let them do the rug pull on you with that. He's giving you an apology and then saying, but we're here to maintain the status quo. We'll put up a damn monument at the top of his reconciliation, which means maintain the status quo. Hey, we know we blew up your side of town and left you all impoverished for generational poverty, but can we settle this over a handshake? Okay, you. we took millions and millions from you here. We murdered your loved ones. Um, can we just settle this over a handshake? Don't you want to be our friend and our pal? Hell no. I can think of something else these hands are good for. And you can get them all day. Earlier, and from decades of discrimination after. I think the greatest change I've seen in my lifetime, and especially just in the last five to seven years, is the openness with which racial disparities are discussed in our city. And we've tried to, over the last, I'd say, 20 years as a community, 
start having those conversations around race in our city that should have been happening for a century, but we've tried to compact all of that into the last 20 years and really in, in earnest into the last decade. Now, do you hear that? Well, you know, I think the really good part here is that we're having conversations about race. You know, we're, we're having discussions and really the big change I've seen is we're actually discussing the racial disparities. Okay, but he, once again, y'all, what is he saying he's gonna do? So I warned you all over a decade ago, the dominant society has no problem acknowledging racism, discussing racism, talking about racism, building monuments about racism. Oh, we need to discuss racism. We need to heal our hearts. Racism, racism. They have no problem discussing racism. Getting them to acknowledge racism is no big achievement. What are they gonna do about it? Now, when you get to that part, that's when the conversation gets real light. That's when the conversation gets real quiet. When you say, okay, damn the talking. Now that we all agree about what has occurred, what are you going to do about this racial disparity? Then the, the room gets real quiet. So don't sit up here and tell yourself that you got to get them to acknowledge racism. They already know it's there. They already acknowledge it anytime you want to. They will acknowledge it so long as you don't require them to actually do something about their racism conversations around race in our city that should have been happening for a century, but we've tried to compact all of that into the last 20 years and really in, in earnest into the last decade. Historians estimate that 300 people may have been killed in the massacre. In 2018, Mayor Bynum announced an effort to find out more using ground penetrating radar, coring and excavation to explore four sites where victims of the massacre may have been buried. Just recently, a team announced that they had sequenced DNA from six sets of human remains exhumed from Oaklawn Cemetery and are now seeking the public's help in identifying them. Now, you understand that we have the same problem, for example, in Wilmington. We have the same problem in Wilmington. And I've already covered that piece before where the librarians and whatnot don't want to give folk records on anything. People if you don't think that what happened at the Black Wall Street is so important, why are there so many people who fight you over it? If what happened in Wilmington is not so important, then why is it that the, the white folks in Wilmington are still covering it up to this day? If it's not really that important, and if it really doesn't matter, why are they fighting so hard to conceal these things to this day? It's an opportunity for us to make Tulsa the kind of city that I think this generation of Tulsans wants it to be. We want to be a city where when horrible things happen to people, we as a city rally around them and do our best to find out what happened and be there for their families and their descendants. Quote, be there for their families and descendants. Be there. We don't need a damn hug. Do you now understand something? This slime ball mayor He's using the words he's using deliberately, which is why I've warned you all about year after year. He's using the words and terms and phrases he's using. He's using all of these words deliberately. Because the real question isn't what is he saying? The real question is listen to what he's not saying. So he keeps saying the same thing over and over again. We need to reconcile. We need to talk. We need to have discussions. We need to get to our feelings. You notice he's, amazingly enough, every time it's time to talk about concrete action, you haven't heard anything yet. And it isn't because uh, Ms. Woodruff edited it out. At the same time, there's a human challenge. There's a, a great lack of trust towards the city because the city didn't do enough. I wonder why, and it's still not doing enough. For so long. The question, that I have and the question that so many North Tulsans have is what are you going to actually do about it? These are a bit. I'll be damned. The second you talk to a black person after he finishes, soon as he finished there, you heard that. So like I said, y'all, it's not because Miss Woodruff and her editing crew have kept it out. That's not the reason. By the way, as soon as that sister says something, did you hear the first thing she got to? She's right there with us. Uh, by the way, we couldn't help but notice you're doing a whole bunch of jaw jacking. W what are you going to do? Well, we're going to get together and discuss our feelings. We already know how we feel. We talking about where's the action. 
for so long. The question that I have and the question that so many North Tulsans have is, what are you going to actually do about it? These are abandoned homes, and you see this throughout my district. City Councilor Vanessa Hall Harper, who represents Tulsa's first district in the north, recently gave me a tour of her district where many black Tulsans live today. Um, and so you have a lot of vacant houses and, and vacant lots. Following the carnage of the massacre, many Greenwood buildings and businesses were rebuilt. But in the decades that followed, developers built a highway through the heart of Greenwood. Okay, let's deal with that right quick. Developers don't build highways. Let's be very, very clear about that. Developers don't build highways and freeways. That ain't, developers can't afford to build highways and freeways. Those are called public works. Governments build that. The United States government pays for that kind of thing. The Highway Act pays for that. Omnibus spending acts pay for that. Gov, de, de, quote, developers, it's not like somebody built a suburb or built a, a built a apartment building and then said, you know what, we need to build a freeway right through here too. So no, it's not developers. It's the government. The same government that blew it up and burned it down. And you notice what they did. They blew it up, burned it down, and then dropped a freeway on top of it to make sure you can't return. That's called socioeconomic warfare. They blew it up, murdered you by the dozens, cleared everybody out, dropped a freeway on top of it, and then said, now you can't return. Now we've got it. Now we're holding it. Now you cannot return. You can't name a single white neighborhood, white community that was ever treated like this. And we got stories like this in literally every city in America with a significant black presence. Doesn't matter what city you are in. Cleveland, Houston, Dallas, Atlanta, Biloxi. Little Rock, if there's a significant black presence, there's a freeway running through where you used to have a black community at. In this case, they dropped the bombs first. In other places, well, we'll just get there as we go. This has always been the plan. The governments have always targeted black neighborhoods for displacement. You damn right, reparations which combined with housing discrimination in the form of race restrictive covenants and redlining drove many residents north. This was the only part of town that black people could live. Today, Hall Harper says her district suffers from poor housing, health care, nutrition and employment. And a 2015 Tulsa Health Department report found a greater than 10 year difference in the lifespan of those living in a zip code in the north versus just a few miles away in South Tulsa. The community living in North Tulsa is African, largely African American, black, brown, and poor people in South Tulsa is largely white affluent. <sighs> black, brown, and poor. All right. And black, brown, and poor people in South Tulsa is largely white affluent. That's a problem. And that's not only a problem for North Tulsans, that's a problem for a city. She campaigned on a promise to address the food deserts in her community. There's nothing in discount dollar stores that's healthy. And in 2021, with support from Mayor Bynum, she helped deliver fresh fruits, vegetables, and dairy in the Oasis Fresh Market. But she says a lot more needs to be done to make this community whole. You know, I grew up, uh, when I had to apologize, I had to do, do more than just say I'm sorry. I had to do all that I can, could do to make right what I had done. She's currently helping to lead a series of community conversations called Beyond Apology to try to engage residents over what more the city should do, including on the question of reparations. So when you speak of reparations, what do you mean exactly by that? I think we are in the process right now of having those conversations beyond apology. But if you're asking me, Vanessa Hall Harper, uh, reparations to me is land and cash. To whom? To everyone that was involved, to the, not only the, 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 the victims, but to their descendants. But not only were individuals destroyed, community was destroyed.
this in, entire space, this entire area was impacted. And so what does that form of reparations look like? I think those are conversations uh, that we must have. Mayor G.T. Bynum. We need to do right by Tulsans who were murdered in 1921. That's why we are doing this search for the graves. We've allocated over a million dollars in city funds that has been unanimously supported by the city council and overwhelmingly supported by the public. The public has overwhelmingly supported our work around economic development. One could view all of that work as reparations. Um, there are others who say you've got to levy a property tax on everyone who lives in Tulsa and issue cash payments. That to me is a much more challenging question because you're financially penalizing everyone who lives in Tulsa today for something that criminals did a hundred years ago. But so you see the little smarmy, slimy, Weasley scumbag mayor. Well, you know, I mean, when you think about it, I mean, that that could be a form of reparations. You don't get to tell us what the hell reparations is. Uh, that we must have. Mayor G.T. Bynum. We need to do right by Tulsans who were murdered in 1921. Did you hear that? No, I want y'all to understand this little dirt bag, scumbag, slime ball is sitting up here. I told you he was using the words and the language he was using very specifically because when you ask him about what are you going to do for concrete action, he then says very clearly, well, we need to do right by the people who were wronged in 1921. We need to do right by the folks who are dead and can't do nothing. We need to, quote, do right by them. How the hell do you do right by dead people? Well, we need to dig up their bones and acknowledge what happened to them so we can all sit around and rub our chakras and have a discussion about it. Oh, as far as their descendants, uh, yeah, yeah. I don't see how you gonna make us pay for that now. So in other words, he's perfectly fine acknowledging what happened on Black Wall Street in 1921. He's perfectly fine addressing it so long as you don't actually do anything. So long as you don't actually disrupt the status quo, so long as that doesn't happen, he's cool. So he was sitting there talking all soft and everything. He looks like a Republican. He's sitting there talking all soft and everything. But right when you get to what we're going to do about it, we're going to maintain the status quo. We need to do right by the people who were killed in 1921. Yeah, about them, but everybody, ain't nothing else, ain't nothing else to be done. All we need to do is dig up some bones and say, well, you know, it's show, it's su show sucks to be y'all. Oh, well, here's a monument. I'll get together with you and sing We Shall Overcome. But in the words of Dr. King, they were okay integrating places and integrating lunch counters. That didn't cost the nation anything. Integrating schools, that didn't really cost them anything. Now we're saying you got to give reparations for what you did to us. Now that's going to cost you. That's going to change the status quo. That's going to create a generation of black millionaires and even billionaires. That's going to kick off generational wealth. You won't be able to kick people around the way you've been doing that will fundamentally change things. So when you heard him talk about what will fundamentally change things, he stopped you real quick and said, no, we ain't going to do nothing that changes anything. We'll sit together and give symbolic gestures. We'll talk about your feelings. But as far as actually changing anything, no, nah, we ain't with that. That's why we are doing this search for the graves allocated over a million dollars in city funds that has been unanimously supported by the city council and overwhelmingly supported by the public. The public has overwhelmingly supported our work around economic development. One could view all of that work as reparations. Economic development. What the hell is economic development? If you are not giving it directly to the black people who are affected by what happened, how the hell is that helping them? Economic development for who? So a bunch of white folk can build a bunch of stores and the black folk can be their customers? What the hell is that? Economic development. Well, you know, if we, if we sit up here and build a freeway through what used to be your neighborhood, and then we bring in some white developers from New York and California to build a shopping mall, and you can be the damn buggy boys and the checkout girls. 
well, we got you a job at the shopping center that we built on top of what used to be your thriving black Wall Street. Well, isn't that a quote? form of reparations now if you turned around and told him we gonna blow up the south side of tulsa all the white folks gonna have to get out and scatter and when we get done we're gonna pave that bastard over turn into a parking lot build a black shopping mall and then we're gonna give y'all jobs at our shopping mall and then tell you well when you think about it becky that's a form of reparations would he be sitting his pasty white ass up here telling you that well i can agree with that one i can back that that's economic development um public has overwhelmingly supported our work around economic development one could view all of that work as reparations um there are others who say you've got to levy a property tax on everyone who lives in tulsa and issue cash payments that to me is a much more challenging question because you're financially penalizing everyone who lives in Tulsa today for something that criminals did 100 years ago. But we're going through a dialogue and the way I think you address it is to keep the dialogue going. Man, look here, damn the talk. The time for talk is over. Cut the check. We done talking. We ain't here to sit up here and talk in circles for damn me ever. We already know what you did. The time for talk is over. Cut the check. We through talking. You already know what needs to be done. It's time to get to the doing. Cut the check. And yet Republican state lawmakers have arguably made that harder. More fallout from the signing of House Bill 1775 in Oklahoma. In 2021, despite opposition from school boards and public universities across the state, Governor Kevin Stitt signed House Bill 1775, legislation restricting how history can be taught in public schools. And as governor, I firmly believe that not one cent of taxpayer money should be used to define and divide young Oklahomans about their race or sex. Okay, so he, teaching about slavery isn't dividing people. Well, yeah, they're okay teaching about slavery just so long as you don't demand to do anything about it. Now that black folk are saying, by the way, because of what we learned about slavery, it's time to do something about it. All of a sudden, so black folk living in squalor and black folk living oppressed and black people being dominated and brutalized, that wasn't divisive. That wasn't divisive. Black folks saying we need to do something about it. Oh, that's divisive. Y'all need to understand these are the American Nazis. These are the American Nazis. If you want to know why it is that I have always rode as hard as I have and rode so hard in the paint for it, these are the Nazis of America. This is the Gestapo and the brown shirts of America. And they are here to do what they have always done. Make it easier to exterminate you. This is ethnic cleansing. This is racial cleansing. And from their haircuts to their janky ass ties to everything else, these are the American Nazis. These are the American fascists. And they are continuing the work that they've been doing now for decades and centuries. So attacking history, they're like, you know what? If history no longer serves white people, then to hell with history. That's what he's saying. And Ron DeSantis and Greg Abbott and a number of other governors around the country. That if history is will no longer maintain the status quo. And if history will no longer maintain white hegemonic power, then they'll say into hell with history, burn all the damn history books, get rid of them, sanitize them, chop out whole decades or centuries. If teaching this history is going to disempower us, then to hell with the history, get rid of it. Throw it out of there. That's what they're doing now. Rip out whole chapters. If it means we got to give up power, then damn history. 
On its face, 1775 is about preventing discrimination on the basis of race or sex. But it includes a provision that says no individual should feel discomfort, guilt, anguish, or any form of psychological distress on account of his or her race or sex, which some worry is so broad and subjective that it's having a chilling effect on the teaching of difficult subjects like the 1921 massacre. Not teaching slavery is attacking us on the basis of race. Not teaching the Tulsa white supremacist race riots is attacking us on the basis of race. Yes, your children should feel very uncomfortable about a classroom that refuses to acknowledge what happened to them because they are targeting you on the basis of race. I think it's ridiculous. I think it's totally ridiculous that you don't teach history uh, of what actually happened just for fear of making someone feel guilty. Teach them also in order for this not to happen, these are the things that we must do. Well, Tulsa Public Schools is the first district in Oklahoma accused of violating a new state law that regulates how districts teach about race and gender. The law is already having real world consequences. Last summer, the accreditation ratings of two Oklahoma school districts, Tulsa and Mustang, were downgraded. In Tulsa, because teachers took part in an implicit bias training. House Bill 1775 was created for this purpose, to create accountability and transparency. Tulsa area resident Janice Danforth spoke in favor of the downgrading at the July State Board meeting in Oklahoma City. I ask you today to follow through and let P TPS be the example across Oklahoma. My state. How many black faces you see in that room? By the way, how many black faces do you see in that room? Think that over for a moment. Do you think that's accidental? You think that's accidental? See, this is the way black folk got to live while they're talking about nobody should be made uncomfortable. I feel damn uncomfortable. See, this is the way they want things to remain is that a black person can be led through a process. I told y'all this way is in court. Do you realize that if you are a black person and you are arrested in America today, you literally could go from being put in handcuffs to put in the jail to go into court to sentence to spend the rest of your life behind bars and never encounter another black person anywhere along the line. You can have your entire fate decided for you by nothing but room after room of white folk. Now, white people can't name anywhere in America that they could go where they could be arrested, tried, sentenced, their kids' books could be confiscated, rewritten, or anything else, and never encounter another white person. It's just a whole bunch of black folk. That can't happen. Hell, they, you can't say that you go to a place where it would be majority black. You can't say that. So they're getting together in gangs, if you will. Getting together in gangs. And saying we are going to bureaucratically, ethnically cleanse this thing. Board meeting in Oklahoma. By the way, now they're not getting together to get rid of the illegals. <clears throat> Did you notice that? No, let me go ahead and remind you. They're not getting together to get rid of the illegals. Did y'all notice that? They're not holding a big meeting to get the illegals out of their schools. They're not holding a big meeting to get the illegals off of the workforces. They're not sitting up here confiscating the property of the white men employing them. They're not getting together to deal with that. Dead silence about that. So clearly that doesn't bother them. But yo black ass, oh, we got something to say about you. Oh, we're holding whole meetings about you. No, not about the illegals. That don't bother us. That doesn't worry us. Nope, we're not worried about that. You, oh, that's a different matter. So they're letting you know they don't give a damn what's going on. We are always public enemy number one and the primary target. Board meeting in Oklahoma City. I ask you today to follow through and let P TPS be the example across Oklahoma that breaking the law is not only unacceptable, it's illegal. And as a district, you will pay the price for that decision. A mother of two boys. 
Uh, somebody come get Skeletor here. She looks like the kind of damn old decrepit idiot sitting at home. She's irrelevant. She has no friends. Take a look at her. She looks like she just crawled up from under somebody's attic or crawled out of a coffin somewhere. Somebody come and get them. She looks like she smells like cats. And yet y'all are listening to her. What the hell? As a district, you will pay the price for that decision. As a district, y'all pay the price for that decision. Boy, doesn't she sound so weak? Don't you hate to hear a Karen jump up or a Gertrude in this case? Don't you hate to hear a Gertrude jump up? She's got no influence anywhere else in life. She probably doesn't even have kids who go to that school, by the way. She probably doesn't even have any children in the schools. How much you want to bet that she doesn't even have any kids in the schools? And yet she heard that white power was under assault somewhere. And she came riding to the rescue on her hover round with her meth and her fentanyl. And she was able to slither and creep her way up to a microphone. This will show you what happens if you don't get in line. Meanwhile, a damn strong breeze could blow her little bony ass away. And I would be all in favor of it if I could stand the stench. As a district, you will pay the price for that decision. A mother of two boys, one in public school, one in private. In 2021, Danforth founded the Tulsa chapter of Moms for Liberty, a nonprofit parents' rights group started in Florida during the pandemic that is now spread across the country. The group is officially nonpartisan, but aligns itself with conservative causes. Danforth says Tulsa Public Schools, which for years have struggled with low funding and test scores, need to focus on academics. And that should really be the only thing they're focusing on and not diversity, equity and inclusion. Are you saying that it's wrong for teachers to be conscious of diversity? Not at all. Then, then what's the argument then? Well, cr critical race theory, or if you want to look at diversity, equity, inclusion, we don't, equity is making everyone equal. That's not the case, right? We can't all be, have the same thing. That, that is Marxism, literally. <laughs> we want equitable, not equity, where everyone has the same opportunity. I am now, here's the problem with the everyone has the same opportunity argument. The problem is that these white supremacists control who gets an opportunity. That's the problem. Everyone has an opportunity. That's not true. Any job you go to, it's limited who has an opportunity. Management slots are not unlimited. Executive slots are not unlimited. City council slots are not unlimited. Who gets to be in charge is not unlimited. Who has access to capital is not unlimited. Who gets approved for contracts is not unlimited. Everybody does not get the same opportunity. And she knows that with her bug-eyed, fish-faced, roach-built ass. She knows that. She knows full damn well. Oh, we control. Everyone should get an opportunity and we're going to control who has the opportunities. That's how y'all sit up here and end up with their handpicked Negroes. Cause she knows they'll con they're throwing you out that phrase that you have equal opportunity. You're not born with equal opportunity, not in a system of white supremacy. You don't have equal opportunity. And she knows it. So all these white folk are sitting here telling you and me that what we need to do is maintain the status quo. Everything they're saying is to sound so syrupy sweet. Oh, we're not threatening, but everything they're saying is maintain the status quo. Don't change anything and don't let anything happen that will actually change something. So yeah, we don't want everyone to be equal. That was the last time she told the truth. Because she knows that her job is to make sure your black children never get the opportunity because she knows those doors are already closed to them. And then when you start telling these black children why the doors are closed, now those children know what to do about it. 
But if you tell them, if you miseducate them and tell them, ain't no door over there, you didn't miss nothing, you're not losing anything, then all of a sudden, what you complaining about, if you didn't get an opportunity, it's because you didn't try hard enough. Remember in my film Race War, when I talked to Jared Taylor, and we were discussing the fact that, by the way, over 60% of your Silicon Valley companies got Asians that's their workforce. And yet when you go into management, less than 10% of it is Asian. Hell, less than 5%. How can they be 60% of the workforce and yet the management and ownership of these companies doesn't reflect their Asian uh, population in their employee base? Remember what he said? Well, maybe they don't have as good a management skills. Maybe they don't have as good a networking skills. No, it's because they don't control the opportunities. Doesn't matter who you bring in, they don't control the opportunities. And he knows that. It isn't because the Asians don't work hard enough. It is because you were brought here to empower these white folk and the white folk ain't going to give you an opportunity to run the company. You'll have an opportunity to work for the company. You'll have an opportunity to go overtime for the company. You will not have an opportunity to run it. So when they tell you about opportunity, just understand that's more trick bag con job language. And tonight I've explained to you why it is. If anybody tells you that, you tell them use a lie because you all control the opportunities and you restrict who gets them. That's not the case, right? We can't all be have the same thing. That That is Marxism, literally. We want equitable, not equity, where everyone has the same opportunity. I asked Dan Forth how teachers are supposed to manage how a student feels about a historical event like the 1921 massacre without worrying about hurting their district's accreditation or jeopardizing their teaching licenses. How do you carefully make that separation though? I think you can show that there were some people in that time frame that were not good people. They they had Ku Klux Klan was a terrible organization that did terrible things to black people. And I think kids can learn about it without having to have that concept put on them like it's their fault. And you think teachers are able to make that distinction, should be able to make that distinction? Absolutely. I think if you're worried about how you're teaching it, then you're probably teaching it wrong. I would not want. So you hear the Karen up here. She is worried that her children will have to compete. And by the way, the other thing here is, aren't these the same white folk who tell you that folks running around talking about their feelings are hurt and everyone wanting to get a participation trophy? Aren't these the same white folk who tell you that that's called woke? You're a snowflake that's woke. On the one hand, they tell you that if you don't like history being taught, oh, that's woke. Now they're, if you're, everybody wanting their feelings to be catered to, and we need to cater to everyone's feelings, that's woke. Um, and here the quote anti-woke people show up saying, we need to worry about our feelings now. And it's not about woke or nothing else focus. I'm right and I, it's, I'm white and I say so. It is not about anything woke. It's I'm white and I say so. So whoever is white and in power, they're going to decide what reality is, what two plus two is. We're white and we say so. And one other thing you do understand, these white folk are not talking about something happening at a private school. Did you understand that? The white folk are no longer saying, well, as long as my kids aren't in the public schools, I'll take my kids out of the public schools and take them somewhere else. You notice she ain't saying that. Did you notice that? She's not saying I'm going to take my kids out the public school and take them to a private school. <laughs> Problem solved. Notice they're not saying that anymore. If this was, so if their goal was for their children not to be affected, they would do what white folk have always done and take their children to private schools. Why is it that you have the ability to put your kids in private schools and yet you're still saying, and we need to crack down on what these public schools are teaching because they don't want anybody to even have a chance at learning how to become revolutionized. 
They want to make sure that they erase this from the population at large. They're not worried about what their white children are learning. They're worried about what your black children are learning because your black children will be the next generation that's going to come up behind us. And every generation, it gets stronger and stronger. It's becoming inevitable. So th they know that, hey, taking my kids to a private school isn't going to prevent reparations from happening. So we can't focus on our white kids in private school. We got to focus on your black kids. If your black kids don't know about slavery and don't know about the black Wall Street and don't know about what we did to them, then they won't be able to ask. They won't be able to demand reparations if they don't know what happened to them. So this is why they're targeting your black schools with the black kids, even though their white kids aren't even in those schools. They're like, yeah, we don't want the schools being used to, quote, radicalize those black children. We're looking for them to bring us out a whole bunch of Ben Carsons and a whole bunch of Tim Scotts. We're not looking for them to make some Francis Cress Wellsings and Dr. John Henry Clarks. We ain't trying to have that. So we're attacking the schools that we originally, quote unquote, desegregated. We desegregated the schools and now we're passing laws that segregate the education in those schools because you learn to empower yourself with these history books. You picked up these history books and learned to empower yourself. That's why we're attacking the schools because you're empowering yourself now. Our fault. And you think teachers are able to make that distinction, should be able to make that distinction? Absolutely. I think if you're worried about how you're teaching it, then you're probably teaching it wrong. I would not want uh, any student in Tulsa taught that they're lesser than someone else because of their race. At the same time, there are legitimate concerns around making sure that we do have difficult conversations and that we learn about difficult history. For his part, Mayor Bynum, a Republican, says if in fact the new state law Yeah, I know. I, I know. Did I call it or did I call it? Is preventing the teaching of history like the events of 1921, legislators should amend it. We're home to the consequences of not talking about difficult history for three quarters of a century right here in Tulsa, uh, where the city fathers after 1921 decided we're not going to talk about this race massacre because it's such an embarrassment. And so now it's left to this generation of Tulsans to try and catch up on all that and investigate it 100 years after the fact, which is really challenging. Also want to keep educating ourselves and our own. That's really important. So Community activist Christy Williams isn't waiting for the legislature to act. She recently started her own program, Black History Saturdays, for young people, their parents, and local teachers to meet once a month to learn in an environment free from the fear of saying the wrong thing. You know, history and learning, is, um, is, it is uncomfortable. But if you understand someone else's history, then you won't treat them like they're an outcast. If you were taught that all I was is a slave, my people were just slaves, you don't see that much in me. So, I mean, it's, it's a benefit for all people to learn. Well, here's the issue here. You're not learning about our history. Our history is American history. If you don't learn our history, then you have not learned American history. Period, point blank, end of discussion. If you have not learned our history, then you did not learn American history. You learned some fabrication handed to you by propagandists, but you did not learn our history. You didn't learn it. There's a lot of work going on right now. A lot of the folks out there are hard at work to see if they can erase us, see if they can supplant us, see if they can go backwards. And the things that have always been credited to us, the changes that have always been credited to us, see if they can shift it over to somebody else. Lately now, the folks who've been changed, um, who have been nominated for it, since they can't give it to the Irish or Italians anymore, since they realize, okay, that one's a bum steer. Now they decided, let's see if we can give the Asians credit for what black folk did. I posted this video. Hold on to your stomachs. 
You might not recognize this man, but you're certainly familiar with his impact. Wong Kim Ark's fight against the American government helped establish U.S. birthright citizenship for everyone, regardless of race or parental immigration status. In August 1895, Wong Kim Ark, who was in his early 20s, returned home to San Francisco after visiting China, a trip he'd made several times before. However, this time he was denied re-entry because the collector of customs refused to acknowledge his status as a U.S. citizen. See, Wong was born in the United States to two Chinese immigrants who were both barred from naturalizing due to their race. The collector, a known opponent of Chinese immigration, barred Wong under the Chinese Exclusion Act, which blocks citizenship for most Chinese immigrants. Even though Wong was born in the U.S., the collector argued that because Wong's parents weren't naturalized, he didn't qualify for birthright citizenship. While the 14th Amendment established birthright citizenship after the Civil War, in practice, it didn't apply to people of all races at the time. Wong was stuck for months on various ships in the San Francisco Bay, but his community rallied behind him and he was eventually able to get legal representation and sue the federal government. His lawsuit went all the way up to the Supreme Court, and surprisingly, Wong won, making his the first case of its kind to see such success. In his landmark case, the United States versus Wong Kim Ark, the justices decided 6-2 to two that under the 14th Amendment, anyone born in the United States is a citizen, no matter their race or parental immigration status. Though the decision hasn't always been respected, it forever changed how citizenship is defined in the U.S. Since then, Wong's case has served as precedent for protecting the citizenship of other U.S.-born people. Now, did you hear what they said originally, by the way? Did you hear this? Let me play this again. I want you to understand this part. Immigrants. Even though Wong was born in the U.S., the collector argued that because Wong's parents weren't naturalized, he didn't qualify for birthright citizenship. While the 14th Amendment established birthright citizenship after the Civil War, in practice, it didn't apply to people of all races at the time. Oh, so what are you saying? Are you saying that the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments were specifically put into place for the descendants of the slaves? Oh, so this was specifically for us. And they immediately went to work trying to dilute it down and change it into something else. Now, that's one way of reading it. One way of reading it is, by the way, it didn't apply to anyone but the descendants of the slaves. That's who we did this for, because we know who we were supposed to do it for. We're supposed to do it for them. In other words, you're acknowledging that there's unfinished business because you've never made good on the Constitution's promises to us. 13, 14, 15 amendments. You've never made good on that. You've given the blessings to other people, but you've never made good on it for the people that this was written for. So I'm just reminding y'all. So now they're talking about this guy Wong. And it's like, by the way, it was a law that you now freely admit was put in place for us. And then you're telling us that he's benefited. He didn't do, he didn't help a damn thing. If the Supreme Court said that we are acknowledging this, they, it wasn't because they passed a new law. They, the Supreme Court is saying that his ability to be recognized as a citizen was not dependent on a new law. It was dependent on the 14th amendment that had already been passed for foundationals. It was already there that what we did, all they did was rubber stamp and say, yeah, this applies to him. He didn't make nothing happen. We made that happen. There weren't a bunch of Asians who got together and there was some groundswell to go to the Supreme Court and they were standing out there by the thousands and the throngs and they were standing out there by the legions and they were standing out there through the winter and the snow and the rain and the ice and the hail. That didn't happen. They went to the Supreme Court and said, hey, you know what them black folks did? Yeah, I think that applied, That should apply to me too. All right, rubber stamp. There you go, Done. He didn't have to fight for legislation. He didn't have to fight for ratification. They didn't have to go state by state. It wasn't the dread. This wasn't the Dred Scott decision. This wasn't the Brown versus Board of Education decision. This wasn't even close. 
He came in here to ride on our coattails. This wasn't even close. And these folks are trying to sit up here and act like he did something monumental. No, he didn't. It's a minor case that literally was already predetermined when you hear the Supreme Court say, oh, it, this doesn't even require a new law. The 14th Amendment already covers you. So they're freely acknowledging that what we did opened the doors for all these other people. You damn right I'm yelling it. Because ain't nobody telling it. Shout out DOC. No beef. You let them tell the damn story and you think that he, this was some crusader for civil rights sitting there on your screen. No, he wasn't. We did all the crusading. We took all the blows. We took all the bullets. We took all the arrows in the back. Some of them from these other minorities. We paved the way. We put up the doors. We built the house and the walls. All these other folk had to do was move in. We did this. Your birthright citizenship, sir, uh, you're welcome. That's all we got to say to you. You didn't help establish a damn thing. We built that. You're welcome. You're welcome. And we continue doing so to this very day. While the rest of them sit up here and tell the world that they did something as we continue building it to this very day. You're welcome, sir. That's all you, we got to say to you. You're welcome. You damn right we built it. Story that you really got to see to believe. You really got to see this to believe this. This is another story from Now This News, the gift that keeps on giving. All I can say is strap yourself in, starting with the very title of this. Yeah, you can see the title of it on your screen. Retired NYPD officer preserves Asian American gang history. All right. Now, now when we talk like that, it's glorifying gangs, but mm, he's preserving the history. Uh, okay, all right. Can't wait to hear this one. Hollywood glamorized the Thai mob, but the Asians, their story are much more colorful. They had connections all over the world with the triads, the Tongs. The Italians, they only controlled basically New York City and maybe some states in the West Coast, but with the Asians, they were moving in the heroin at a much larger volume. They were making a lot more money. Oh, you mean what black folk been saying the whole time? Because you see, when we said that here on the black channel, they told us that was wrong. When Tariq said that, they told him he was making it up. They told us that we were being xenophobic. They told us that we were fabricating this. This is a retired NYPD officer telling you, oh, by the way, we were much bigger than the Italians. Now, some of what he's saying there is not actually accurate because the Italian mafia had a hold on New York, New Jersey, Chicago, Philadelphia, New Orleans. Remember, it was Carlos Marcello that put a hit on the U.S. president, John F. Kennedy. As time goes on, now they get bold enough and they're no longer cow so cowardly that they won't acknowledge the obvious, but it was the, uh, the Italian mafia of Louisiana, Carlos Marcello, put the hit on JFK. Something that the New York mafia, Philadelphia mafia, Carlos Marcello was so strong and was so inevitable from Louisiana, he killed a sitting U.S. president. So I would tell the gentleman he might want to update the, the he might want to update date the stump speech. I know, you, you, you're putting a little bit too much icing on the stump speech, brother. You're putting a little bit too much icing on it. But uh, if we sit up here and say it like it is, it's like, eh. But he is right about the fact that they, they've been moving heavyweight for decades. They've been moving super heavyweight. Let's just keep it a buck. Frank Lucas, come on now. Could they have made the bread they did without the Asian connect? It wasn't the Italian connect that built him into what he was. It was the Asian connect. It was the Asian plug that did it. 
Can we say that? Am I saying too much? Am I about to get in trouble? Am I about to burst some bubbles? Some folks didn't know that. Y'all know it, Frank Lucas. Hey, it wasn't the Italians that got him built. He got the Asian plug. Once he got the Asian plug, that was it. Never looked back. Okay, but who did they come and arrest? Frank Lucas had the Asian plug, but only Fra only the black folk went to prison. Did you see any Asians on the stand or getting indicted along with Frank? Nope, get your black ass in the paddy wagon. You coming with us. With the Asians, they were moving in the heroin at a much larger volume. They were making a lot more money. The major gangs in New York City from the 1970s up until the mid-1990s were the Flying Dragons, Ghost Shadows, Dong On, BTK, Green Dragons, Fuk Ching, and White Tigers. There was a surge in the gang activity during that time, especially uh, the drug trade. When the Italians left the uh, heroin business, they left the vacuum. Uh, a lot of the gangs were doing recruitment during that time. And then uh, it was very easy to attract these kids from poor family and new immigrants coming in without. Let me replay this part again so you hear what he said. And white tigers. There was a surge in the gang activity during that time, especially uh, the drug trade. When the Italians left the uh, heroin business, they left the vacuum. Uh, a lot of the gangs were doing recruitment during that time. And then uh, it was very easy to attract these kids from poor family and new immigrants coming in without any opportunities. Throughout all those years, I was the only Asian kid in my class, and I, I was bullied. And to get protection from those bullies, I joined the gang. So he's letting y'all know he had to get mobbed up when he was a kid. But understand something else. So he's telling you that after the Italians, you know, fell back on the hard drugs, they never got out of it completely, but they fell back because the government was coming at them. The Asians stepped in. Okay, but I ask y'all. When's the last time you saw a RICO indictment against the Asians? The Asians are move, moving super heavyweight. Will someone tell me who's the Asian mobsters, the Asian gangs who've been put up on RICO charges? Because they brought in Nikki Barnes people by the damn dozens. And yet I've never seen a trial where the Asians were brought into court by the dozens. Hell, you can't get them in there by the threes. They ain't brought in there by the dozens. You go to a penitentiary, it'll be three Asians in the whole damn building. So y'all moving the majority of the weight. Y'all moving the majority of the white. Y'all moving the majority of the brown. Y'all moving the majority of the black. And yet, when we look in the prisons, you ain't to be seen. Someone explain to me how you can be moving the majority of the weight out there and yet no RICO indictments, no charges, no nothing. We don't have an Asian John Gotti. Now, is that by accident or is that by design? Today, I still see the same problems, but a lot less because there are more resources out there and more opportunities for, for the kids out there. There's still a lot of criminal activities going on in Chinatown, but there's a lot less recruiting. They operate in more like uh, cliques or cells or just a few people. They don't have a hierarchy anymore. It's still around. I mean, you know, there's kids who want to have that sense of belonging. So hopefully there's um, more resources out there to keep the kids away from this type of life. Now you heard what he just said. He said they're still out there, but they operate in cells there is no hierarchy. Now, that's anathema to a gang. There's no such thing as a gang that doesn't have hierarchy. But what you do, if you do say something like that, then what you're saying is that the code is the leader. That they all have a code that they adhere to. Therefore, everyone is part of the hierarchy because everyone has adopted the code. When you join a gang, you're either going to wind up dead, hurt, or in prison. Some of my friends uh, got shot and they're paralyzed for life, and some of them are never going to be the same again. The 
So there's a lot of information out there that's not accurate about the Asian gangs. It's because Asian gangs had such a tight grip on the Asian community that even to this day, they're afraid to talk about them. And their kids only hear bits and pieces and whispers about the life back in those days, but they don't know what really happened. And that's one of the reasons why I started this channel is to be able to preserve this piece of history and just pass it on to the future generation because this is history. It may sound violent or it may be, um, you know, not what you want to hear, but Sir, it doesn't sound violent. It is violent. It may sound violent. No, sir, actually it is. It actually is. This is history. It may sound violent or it may be, um, you know, not what you want to hear, but it happened. He's just preserving Asian gang history. Now, when we do it, we glorify in gang violence. When we do it, now this is, oh, he's preserving Asian American. Oh, isn't that so nice? He's preserving Asian American gang history. And this is a former cop, y'all, 26 years. Gang member becomes cop in New York. And you wonder why niggas is getting beat down all over the damn place. These are just the Asians. What about the, Dom how many Dominican gang members are members of the NYPD, LAPD? You already know LA Sheriff's Department. How many of them are members of these police departments and sheriff's departments riding around right now? Riding around today. How many of them? Come on now. And then you wonder why Peter Liang was able to walk. Then you wonder why Peter Liang was able to walk. 720 degrees of the analysis that you'll receive absolutely nowhere else.